We have three fabulous respondents here. Uh, to start with, on Eric's left, immediate left, is Dr. Lois Edman. She is a professor of conflict, conflict resolution studies at Menno Simons College. She has a practice in conflict resolution and in particular facilitates large group conflict resolution. She has research interests in the area, areas that intersect psychology and peace studies. And she has published articles on the positive psych psychology of peacemaking and on Mennonites in peacemaking. Then our, our second respondent is Annette Desmarais. She's the Canada Research Chair of Human Rights, Social Justice, and Food Sovereignty based at the University of Manitoba. She has written several books, including most recently the book La Via Campesina, Globalization and the Power of Peasants. She's also written many articles on the topic of food sovereignty. Prior to obtaining her PhD in geography, she farmed for 14, year, 14 years in Saskatchewan. And she has worked for over a decade as a technical support to trans, transnational peasant movements called La Via Campesina. Finally, on the, the far left is Mr. David Northcott, who is the executive director of Winnipeg Harvest. And he has worked there since 1984, although there have been some periods where he's been involved in other things, like running for federal office, working at the University of Winnipeg's Institute for Urban Studies, and other activities. He's very engaged in civil society, including the, being the founder of the Canadian Association of Food Banks and the Manitoba Association of Food Banks. He's on several boards, and he has received both the Order of Manitoba and the Order of Canada. So what I'm going to do is ask that um, each of our respondents, starting with, uh, with Lois, that um, they would share for three to five minutes a particular insight, uh, something that struck them, and, and then ask a question. And, and we'll, we'll collect the questions, if, if that's all right, Eric, and, and then we'll come back to Eric and give him a chance to respond to those questions as a collective, and then there can be some, maybe some scope for some interaction after that. So, uh, so we're gonna start with, with Lois. Good evening, everybody. I have always been amazed since coming to uh, Menno Simons College by the opportunities that we have for interdisciplinary discussion. I am a psychologist, we have a physicist, we have a, a farmer, we have an environmental scientist, and we all have different vocabularies. We have uh, sometimes incompatible theories, and yet we can talk about the same realities. I've always appreciated that, and I really appreciate the way that you've opened this up for us. Uh, it seems only obvious that hunger must be related to deathly crisis and to violent conflict. You, Eric, have noted the vast concern that goes all the way from single hungry families to organizations that combat hunger and to powerful policymakers as well. You've described comp comprehensively the food rebellion and injustice. We appreciate what you've said. It's been informative and provocative, and we want to thank you. I do want to offer a, a personal prayer and a hope for you that while here in Manitoba, you will not lose your ears as you're afraid you will. <laughs> In peace and conflict studies, we distinguish negative peace from positive peace, and thus negative justice making from positive justice making. Negative justice making means to simply end a crisis, end the struggle. Unfortunately, that might sound like something like, you farmers, you go and live your lives without interference from us, and God bless you. It might sound something like charity, but clearly, negative justice making is not enough. I think that Eric's um, presentation makes that very clear. Positive peace building is positive justice making that effectively transforms the roots of the injustice. Racism, cultural imperialism, ecological jeopardy, trade injustice, to create positive well-being. 
We need to, and we do, commit ourselves to positive peace building and positive justice making that will eliminate the roots of poverty and hunger. I was reminded of a passage from the Judaic scriptures, the prophet Isaiah, that said this, this is the type of fast I choose to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the thongs of the yokes, to let the oppressed go free, and to share bread with the hungry. I will bring the wanderers home. When I see nakedness, I will cover them and not turn away from my own people. There is an appeal to this commitment. Basically, everyone wants peace. Everyone is willing to create justice for our own people and for people everywhere. But the conundrum that we have is the practice. How do we go beyond the futility of the liberal and reforming phases? Our own lifestyle, our Canadian world style in many ways is a violent lifestyle without our choosing that. So could you, can you point the way? Can you say a little bit more about the pathway for tra dramatic transformation that can lead us toward justice? What does it take to transform impotence and futility into determination and real justice making. Okay, thanks very much, Lois. And uh, now Annette. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. I mean, it's a real privilege to actually be here um, to comment, to offer some comments and to ask uh, Eric some questions. I actually first met Eric, I don't know if he remembers, but it was in Nicaragua in 87, I think, or 88 when he was there working uh, with the Farmers uh, Union in, uh, of Nicaragua, working on a campesino to campesino, farmer to farmer uh, project. Um, and in fact, you should you know, s spend some time explaining what that uh, work was all about. Um, I, I wanted to just say that I really appreciated the way that you uh, <coughs> talked about, stressed the importance of looking at the root causes, and you took us through, uh, you know, the, the root causes um, that led to the ongoing uh, food crisis. Uh, and uh, I also appreciated the fact that you then uh, moved to a discussion of what some of the scientific literature had, had told us about the causes of, of, the, uh, of the crisis and, and, in fact, gave us an awful lot of information of where we were at. Um, I just wanted to maybe mention another study, a more recent study, um, and it's not as big as the one that Eric uh, talked about, the um, I, asked, I asked, how do you pronounce it? I said, uh, that was a, a, a huge uh, global study, but um, just in September two, uh, 2013, in 2013 um, UNCTAD uh, produced a study uh, called, it, it was part of their environment and trade uh, review, and it was called um, uh, Wake Up Before It's Too Late make agriculture truly sustainable now for food security in a changing climate. And essentially that study repeated a lot of the same messages that the ISDAD did, except that I think it did so with, with a much more urgency. Um, the wake up before it's too late states that there's a need for a paradigm shift, whereas the first study said that we needed change, but you know, it, and it talked, actually the first one talked about the possibility of food sovereignty. Whereas the UNCTAD study, you know, said clearly we need a paradigm shift. And they, they clearly said that what we, the, this paradigm shift had to move from a green revolution to an ecological intensification approach. The authors argued that this is not just about tweaking the industrial food system. Instead, and I quote, uh, it implies a rapid and significant shift from conventional monoculture-based monoculture and high external input dependent industrial production toward mosaics of sustainable regenerative production systems that also considerably improve the productivity of small-scale farmers. They also had all kinds of uh, evidence 
um, that really challenged the, some of the major, major assumptions that the industrial food system is based on. And essentially argued that, and I quote, hunger and malnutrition are mainly related to lack of purchasing power, which you clearly uh, described, talked about in your talk, and or the inability of the rural poor to be self-sufficient. Meeting the food security challenge is thus primarily about empowerment of the poor and their food sovereignty. So these two publications, uh, which provided a substantial scientific literature on the need for a different kind of agriculture, one that moved us away from what we had, what we now have. Um, was also, you know, has also been supported by the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, who was actually here in Winnipeg uh, about a year ago. And um, I think it's also important to note that for, you know, over 20 years, the, the small-scale farmers and peasants of the world had been telling governments and international institutions that a crisis, that there was a crisis in the agricultural sector, that change was absolutely key. It was, de it was desperately needed. And it's actually interesting to consider that, you know, it, it, took, it, it took 40, uh, it took riots in 40 countries before the international community realized that there was a food crisis. You know, so now we have, you know, for 20 years, farmers telling us there's a crisis, there's a crisis. And then we have riots telling us, they're telling us clearly demonstrating that there's a crisis. And finally, some solution or pseudo solutions are being offered. And I think you gave some pretty good examples of what's on, on being offered. But clearly, and then this is what you were ending with, and I'm going to end with, what is needed is a shift in political will, which you clearly said. And you also demonstrated the, the important, the critical role that social movements, that food movements play in shifting public opinion, which then leads to, hopefully, a shift in political will with the introduction of you said reforms. I would say maybe, I, I, would, I was, I was going to ask you why you use the word um, reforms for the kinds of changes that we need. Although you did go on to explain that they were, the, this, these would be reforms that would lead to transformations. But I'd like to maybe hear your, your take on that a little bit. And to talk more about the kinds of linkages that are possible or not possible between the various uh, kinds of movements that you had in your last um, slide. Thank you, Anna. David. <laughs> yeah, what they said. I have a degree in physics. <laughs> and it, um, I work at a food bank. But the interesting piece, it provides a discipline and a framework to be able to look at the environment and look at uh, structures, look at issues, uh, look at poverty, look at hunger. And that's what you've done here. You've put a frame of reference on the table that's fairly unique and it's daring. And I think you've really tweaked the giant. And I think you've done really well with that. But look out, it's gonna bite you on the ass. Unfortunately, it'll bite all of us. I think that's this transition is tough. What does that transition look like? What does the journey look like? What are the steps we need to take to do that? How do we do it in strength and et cetera? So really, really well done. I think there's a lot of richness that can come out of this. this uh, I think you missed one thing, and, and the Christian condition and the Christian caveat is to be able to feed the hungry, release the captives, et cetera, and to love one another. And I think that component of loving one another is dismissed when we talk about just justice. We need good justice and we need good charity as defined in, in, in biblical language, loving one another, forgiving one another. That piece from the Aboriginal community is calling Winnipeg Harvest through our Aboriginal elder is saying food is sacred and if food is sacred, then all people should be at that table and respectfully and lovingly. So add that component and then that, that sort of adds the spiritual depth to this because it's not just about a commodity. Food is greater than that. Um, I think the framework, though, allows this kind of dialogue, and I think you should be patted on the back regularly. We should invite him back probably annually just to make sure we're refreshed on a regular basis. 
maybe June next yeah, time. Not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. I need you to answer a question for me. There's two women I want to tell you about, and, and I would like to ask you what you would say to them. The first one, uh, a very quick story, she plants seeds, and she plants seeds in plastic tubes, water them, and the little seedlings grow up to be trees, and the trees are put on a, on a, on a slope beside her to try to reclaim the, the, the land and reclaim the soil and keep the water going so that her village can, uh, again, sort of grow properly. Been doing this for about a decade, she gets paid enough money so that every two weeks she gets a bushel of grain and about a liter of canola oil to cook with. She's done that for nine years. When I visited her, her conversation with me was, the last question to me was, isn't it time for a raise? In this city, about a year ago, a single mom with three kids who has been on welfare in this province for way too many years. The welfare rates have not changed in 25 years in this province. And she receives a housing allowance that went up $25 in the last 20 years. And when she had the chance to visit with the minister uh, who handles all that system in this province under an NDP government, and she asked the question, isn't it time for a raise? Eric, what would you say to these two women? Okay, so thank you, respondents. Uh, which order you want to respond is, is your call and you know if we want some interaction too I just want to make sure that we have a good chunk of time to to get the audience uh, interacting as well well I'll start with the last question um, I would say yes <laughs> um, isn't it time for a raise basically means um, you know I need to improve my livelihood this is not making it. And um, I think we can understand raise in different ways. Um, and if we apply it to the condition of the countryside and the condition of the majority of the world's farmers who are women, who don't have enough land, and who um, are poor, and so when they take their goods to market, they are paid at a low price, both because they're poor and because they're women. Um, and then, you know, six months later, they're buying back food because they've run out, and they're paying triple and five, six times the price than what they sold it for in the first place. Um, not because they don't know how to farm, um, and but because they don't have enough land or they don't have access to the water or because they're being um, uh, exploited in the market and living under very difficult conditions. Um, that's true for most of the farmers in the world. And even farmers in the world living under better conditions in the north are still, for the most part, not doing well. And most people either want their kids to get out of farming or the kids want to get out of farming. Um, it's, we need a raise. People need incomes that, they, we need parity incomes. We need parity farm incomes, right? We need to be paid fairly for our work. And that's not just true of farmers. I mean, most laborers, and certainly in the service sector, and, and, and restaurants, and processing plants, and, and certainly farm workers, are not paid fairly. And if people were paid fairly, then they could afford good food. You know, there's this conundrum, oh, but you know, good food is so expensive, organic is so expensive. Well, on the one hand, we, we subsidize the bad food, and not the good food, so the good food is more expensive than the bad food, and then we exploit the people producing the bad food, and they can't afford to buy anything except bad food. They can't afford to buy the good food. Well, how about if we pay people a decent salary so they can afford to buy the good food? And it doesn't have to come only, and it shouldn't only come in the form of salary. We need to invest in the social wage. That means for most of the world in the countryside, we need schools, health clinics, water systems, electricity, roads, you know, people need to be able to live well. And if all those things are paid for, 
Well, then you have more disposable income so that you can pay more for your food. Because we don't pay the true cost of food. We pay it indirectly. We don't pay it directly. So I would say yes, we need raises, but I want to expand that in terms of we need um, viable livelihoods. And it's not that they're not viable because they're somehow inefficient. It's because most of the people in the world, particularly producers, are being exploited. And um, the other two questions about transformation and reform, and uh, the first being, you know, what is the pathway towards transformation for justice? And the second being, well, what are we talking about when we talk about reforms and um, what are the linkages between social movements? I think I can answer uh, together. And yes, I, I, I use the term reforms um, uh, sort of liberally in, in, the, in the sense that uh, I, I try to distinguish between uh, palliative reforms, reforms which simply perpetuate the system as has happened historically, and transformative reforms, ones which would, for example, um, either abolish or you completely turn the WTO on its head, um, ones which would probably outlaw uh, the World Bank and, and the IMF, ones which would uh, renegotiate or scrap um, most of the uh, free trade agreements. So those are the reforms. <laughs> Maybe I should use a different term, but um, I think that uh, this is really a political question because people can rebel and people are rebelling and people can attempt to do things differently and they are. Sooner or later you sort of hit a glass ceiling. It doesn't matter how many organic carrots you grow or eat or distribute in the inner city. Um, you're still poor. You still are not going to be able to afford good food, whatnot. Um, so it's very important to get the practices and the policies, or the politics, beyond the policies, the politics right. And that's, I think, that the, the path towards um, these type of transformative reforms is food sovereignty. Now, the challenge of food sovereignty, which basically means taking back the food system right, from the monopolies, um, is a global challenge, and it's many-sided, and it needs both producers and consumers to make it work. Um, and I, that's where we get to the linkages. So we do need linkages, and we're seeing linkages but we're also seeing obstacles to these linkages. I call them alliances, because they're more than just linkages. It's more than just, well, we're linking these consumers to these producers. No, these consumers and these producers are allies, strategic allies, in the politics of food sovereignty. So um, I was reminded of our conversation earlier today at, at lunch about the need for, to share a vision uh, in order to establish an alliance, you sort of have to share a vision to make sure that uh, your paths are converging. And you agree that maybe we're not on the same path, but they're converging. Because we need to converge in order to get there. And I believe that we do need to converge in all of this great diversity um, in the food movement. One of the uh, examples I've given in the classes that I've spoken in today and yesterday is Via Campesina and the World March for Women. A tremendous convergence, two of the strongest social movements in the world have converged strategically. Via Campesina, uh, among other things that Via Campesina has done regarding um, equality for women, said food sovereignty, in order to have food sovereignty, we need to end all violence against women. Period. That's the platform of Via Campesina. So you cannot understand food sovereignty without understanding an end to all violence against women. So that means structural violence as well as physical violence, um, uh, family violence, all kinds of violence. And um, now this makes sense since most of the farmers are, in the world are women. But you know, in many of the orga farmer organizations of the world, they're run by men. Well, Via Campesina is taking steps, has taken steps to end that, um, both you know, in terms of the demographic representation 
within Via Campesina, but also by adopting this very um, uncompromising stance on violence against women. The World March of Women adopted food sovereignty as a demand of women. And of course, that makes perfect sense as well, since so many women produce food and they're so horribly exploited. It makes sense that the World March of Women would then adopt food sovereignty as a strategic position, part of their platform. So we see a strategic alliance. We see a convergence of these paths for liberation. I mean, food sovereignty is about liberation. World March of Women is about liberation. Um, so I think that the, the, um, the way to, to sort of spot these allies is ask yourself, are they working for liberation? And if they are working for liberation, well, we must be able to find a way to converge between what we're working on in the food system and whatever else you have, labor rights, women's rights. I mean, um, so I think that's essential. And the other thing is, I think that we are in many ways uh, privileged in the North and certainly those of us who come to university and whatnot. Uh, in ways which protect us from our own hopelessness and provide us with all kinds of options, uh, which then gives us optimism. Um, now, a lot of these options are false and are, are complete myths, and, um, and, then, and then many of us get very disillusioned and uh, you know, lose hope and whatnot. In this work, Doing this type of transformation, which is so deep, so structural, so historic in terms of its, of its uh, importance, um, it's very easy to get discouraged. And you know, I work at Food First. We study the corporate food regime. It's incredibly depressing. I get home at the end of the day. I just want to have a drink. Um, or actually, halfway through the day, I just want to have a drink. <laughs> but, and I think I, I, I wouldn't have been able to do this if it hadn't been for the fact that over 30 years ago, um, I was taken in by peasant communities and developed a very deep relationship of compassion. And they taught me that, you know, we can't do this without love and compassion. You know, I lived in villages that were extremely poor. No one ever died of hunger. That was unheard of. No one would ever die of hunger. Either we all die or nobody dies. No one would ever die of hunger. If they had no food, someone would always bring food. Um, and I think that compassion and allying oneself, those of us of privilege, need to ally ourselves with those for whom giving up hope is not an option. They won't let you give up hope either. It's like, get over it. Yeah. Hmm? Let's get back to work here. We love you, now get back to work. Eric, can I, can I just break in? And, and just say, as Eric's kind of coming to, to final comments here in, in response, can, can you all start to think of questions and comments that you want to share with, with Eric and, and the panelists? And, and if you want to start to come towards the, the microphones here, we can, we can move to some, um, some interaction with you all, because that's a really important part of, of this process. And I know last time with, um, <clears throat> with Nettie, we had some really, and, and, and her respondents, we had some really good interaction. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Eric finish off, but if I could just invite you, if you wanna come and, and you could sit uh, or wherever you're comfortable, and uh, we can kind of move to that in, in just a minute. So, Eric, if you want to just finish off your point, and then, I don't know, Lois and, and David and Annette, if you had uh, you know, a response to, to Eric's point here. This is a really <coughs> fabulous uh, uh, set of comments. But Eric, did, did you Okay, I guess just to finish off, the, these alliances and these linkages that we need in order to build a strong uh, movement um, face obstacles, mm -hmm. historical obstacles, personal obstacles organizational obstacles, institutional obstacles. And I'll just name a few. And I say this because um, sometimes these issues are seen as uh, sort of extracurricular activities to the real work of food sovereignty or of food justice. Right? And I don't think that they're extra at all. I think they are the work. So I would say 
um, dismantling white privilege is essential. We have to dismantle racism in the food system and we cannot come together. And that means we have to recognize white privilege when we see it. And we have to understand internalized oppression. And this is very difficult to do, but there's no other way. This is the work. Dismantling uh, patriarchy. We can't possibly have an equitable food system where most of the women in the world produce the food under a patriarchal system. That's absolutely inequitable and it's unsustainable. So these, just those two things, among other classism, racism, sexism, we could go on and on. But we have to address these things not only in our food system, which were they're the foundations of the food system. <laughs> we have to address them within our food movement and within our own organizations and within ourselves. And it's not an easy thing to do, but I, I really don't see any other way. And so I'm very um, glad that you're here tonight and, that, and with your comments because, you know, these are and can be deeply psychological issues that we need to grapple with. Um, and so we need to not just make time for those things, we need to prioritize those things in order to build a strong movement. Lois, Annette, David, would you like to make a, a response? Um, I would just maybe like to um, give a quote from uh, the general coordinator of the Via Campesina because it really captures what you just said. Uh, we were both at a meeting at The Hague where um, the Elizabeth uh, Mofu, uh, the general coordinator of the Via Campesina, gave the keynote address and she said, as peasants, we believe that we are on this earth to grow food, food for our families, food for our communities, food for our countries. We are not just resisting. We are also trying to build something new, a better world, with our ideas, with our actions. Our gift to humanity is the idea that we can all struggle together <laughs> um, to build food sovereignty. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we have uh, a first questioner. So come on and uh, please uh, feel, uh, feel free to share with us. Hi. Uh, coming from an agricultural background myself, and now being a businessman, um, you had mentioned that subsidizing to help for better wages would better help us with the food sovereignty. Now, I don't know much about the South American stuff and African that, but coming from a North American standpoint, I would just kind of like a little bit more of an elaboration on how you think that that might be able to be accomplished because, as I said, coming from a business standpoint, <clears throat> your profit margin is to buy low, sell high. But the farmers are stuck in a perpetual loop of buy high while selling low. <coughs> I was just wondering if you could expand more on what, what you think would be a good way to get the farmers out of that perpetual loop of loss. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to uh, say, if I said it, I didn't mean to say that we need to subsidize wages. I think we just pay fair wages. Um, you can legislate these things. Just like you can, we have tools, as you come from a farming background, you know, we have tools to ensure, um, you know, parity or close to parity prices. I mean, these are well known. We just don't use them anymore. So, um, you know, basically, here's an idea pay a farmer a fair price, then you wouldn't have to subsidize them, yeah. all right? Um, how would you do that? Well, you'd have to control uh, production. You couldn't be overproducing, right? Because you don't want to drop the bottom out of the market. So, you, you know, so you might need marketing boards, like the kind you've just dismantled here in Canada. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not being facetious. We dismantled ours too, you know, long before you did. So um, don't do what we do. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I just pay a fair price. Pay people a fair price for their labor. They, then they'll be able to buy the food, the food they need. You know, I, it, I think it's a, you know, it's, these sound simple, these are tremendous shifts because it means moving away from a consumer culture. It, re, it means moving away from um, solving the, the problems of overconsumption by consuming more. <laughs> um, 
and, and it means, in a, in a way, it means degrowth. It means that we can't just endlessly grow our economies like this. The reason food is, has been cheap is so people could, could buy other goods, mm -hmm. right? If food is not cheap anymore, yeah, you can raise, raise wages and people can buy more food, but they're going to buy less of other things, right? right? Um, well, you know, maybe we have to stop throwing so many things away. I mean, there's a lot of ways, I think, that the, the, the economy has to be adjusted. Whenever these big changes have happened in the past, they've started with agriculture. I think it's probably going to be no different now. So I, I hope that answers your yeah. concern. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. any of you wanted to. Anybody else want to? No? OK. So please, uh, other questions. Um, I'm just thinking this is, I think, probably the first time that we've um, you know, heard in, in these, this series, heard um, reference to things like the vision. And, and the need for a, a broad vision. I, I mean, I think some of our other speakers maybe touched uh, slightly on that, but I think Eric's really captured that. I also notice for the first time um, reference to things like love and care, or maybe not the first time, but quite amplified this time. And I, I think that's a very interesting point. And, and then finally, a, another relatively new thing I think in this series is the reference to spirituality. And I think there was reference, references to ju the Judeo-Christian tradition. I think we could also make connections to is the Islamic tradition, Hindu tradition. I think there was reference to the Aboriginal traditions. And, and so there's this sort of spiritual dimension that's been referenced um, uh, tonight. So that's really interesting as well. I, I think we have another questioner. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Eric. Um, being with you over the last couple of days has really uh, energized me, and so I, I hope it's okay that I'm jumping back up to the mic to ask you another question. Uh, a student of mine said something to, to me a couple weeks ago in, in one of, I think it was in a politics class that he was taking, where the instructor asked how many students were a member of a political party, and no one raised their hand. And then the professor, the instructor asked how many people are a member of a, a community-based organization or another uh, civil society organization or some kind of activist uh, organization. And it was like eight, nine people out of ten. So when you talk about democratizing the food system, you talk about democratizing a capitalist corporate agio oligopolical, sorry, <laughs> corporate, we'll go with that. We talk about democratizing a corporate capitalist food regime or food system in the face of not, of a kind of depoliticization, but also a, a kind of repoliticization. Um, I'm really keen to hear what, what your thoughts are and from anyone in the panel. I mean, I'm a, I'm a student, I, my background's in political studies and so the, the problem of democratizing capitalism seems really pertinent and, and powerfully compelling to me, but how do we navigate that, the, the, dis, the disengagement and the ir, irre, irrelevance, if that's the right word, of formal politics, and I think it maybe goes to some of the things you've already said about alliance building, so thank you. Sure. Do either of you want to address this first? Or? No, you're visiting. You can go home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll stay here. First. Thank you. Uh, very polite of you. Um, well, I mean, this is a, a deep question. It's a historical question. And I'm actually not a historian. Um, but I'll refer to one. So I'll refer to the work of, of Samir Amin. And um, Samir Amin wrote the uh, preface to um, Food Movements Unite, which was one of our last books. Uh, and it's a chaptered book. There, there are contributions from food movement leaders around the world, a number of whom are from Via Campesina. Um, but Samir Amin says that uh, in the past, the older forms of political organizing um, unions, political parties, for example, uh, were actually very effective at introducing um, sweeping reforms, labor reforms, for example, uh, uh, democratic reforms. Um, but that over time, what's happened is that these forms of political organization have become ineffective in part because capitalism has moved on. Um, 
and in part because society itself has become much more diverse. There are, are many other concerns regarding human rights and um, of, of all stripes and flavors, right? Which are, were not being addressed in the unions or the political parties or the political military organizations or the revolutionary organizations that try to grab state power and whatnot, and it just wasn't happening. And so, yes, people who want change became disaffected and depoliticized in many ways. And then you have sort of the influx of all the NGOs and the foundations, which many who, by their own charters, are apolitical, are not supposed to become involved in politics. And, you know, I think you just take a look at our parliaments. I won't speak for the Canadian parliament. Take a look at the US Senate and the House of Representatives, and that should be enough to make you completely disillusioned with party politics. I mean, completely useless in terms of solving any problems whatsoever. Um, so, it's, so we shouldn't be surprised that in a room of young people, you say, who belongs to a pretty political party? Nobody raises their hand because what a waste of time. Um, but then this, is, this provides, presents us with a challenge, a sort of double challenge, which I've spoken about uh, over the last couple of days. One is, how do we repoliticize? Because we need politics. You can't just be apolitical about this and just, you know, grow gardens or, or live your own lifestyle, whatever it happens to be. You know, I mean, it's beyond that now. So how do we repoliticize? And the other is how do we converge in all of this diversity? We're much more diverse in terms of our social movements than we ever were in the past. And you know, we don't know how to do this. We have to invent this. And as we said earlier, there are obstacles. Um, I think one of the extremely important contributions of Via Campesina and the notion of food sovereignty is that it repoliticizes food security. It brings the politics back in um, just by using that word sovereignty. So all of a sudden you get all these discussions. Sovereign from what? The state? From the corporations? What sovereign? The king? You know? So immediately you begin talking about politics and that gives you a chance then to engage in a process of what in Spanish we used to call concientización, you know, political awareness building. And um, so I, you know, I think that's the, I think that is the challenge, and I think that is what's happening. And I notice a lot of the young people that we work with, we get a lot of interns at Food First, and we work with social movements in the United States, um, and many of the food movements, in the food justice movement in the United States, are run by youth. And what I see is that they're increasingly dissatisfied with sort of the apolitical orientation of the NGOs with whom they are associated. They can tell that this isn't getting to the root of the problem. It's not radical, it doesn't go to the root. And they're asking for a radical understanding. And they want to take radical action. They are attempting to repoliticize themselves. And maybe that's where it starts. You know, it starts with the self and then moves on out from there. Yeah, Annette, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, I think one of the things that makes the Via Campesina so successful as a global movement and one that is also very successful at a local level is the fact that um, members of the Via Campesina work at all levels, at all spaces. I mean, they will not, they'll make strategic choices not to engage with the WTO, for example. But at all of the other levels where influence can be exerted, they take, they, they take an opportunity to, to make themselves heard there. And I think that that's, that's something that we need to remember, I think. I mean, while we in Canada, uh, as in Europe and in the United States, while many of us have been, um, uh, you know, we've lost our appetite for engagement in the, in, with political parties, uh, in other countries, like in Honduras, for example, where I just was, um, uh, I was there as a member of a, an international delegation observing the elections. Well, democracy, uh, the, the struggle for democracy is absolutely critical to food sovereignty. 
in Honduras. For example, the farm leader there who was running for political office in the, in the parliament um, clearly said to me, you can't, we can't have food, uh, uh, food sovereignty without democracy. Now, democracy in Honduras <laughs> is not just about going to the ballot box every four years. And that's part of the problem here, is that we've interpreted democracy as just going to that, that ballot box every four years. Well, food sovereignty democratize, it means democratizing the food system, which means that every single day you're, you are involved in discussions about what you're eating, and you're involved in discussions with others about what you're eating, what are the, you know, what are the, the, the politics of the food that you're eating. Um, so it's, it's a much deeper, deeper understanding of democ democracy. What can democracy mean? Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's, that's another really in, important gift from the Via Campesina is they've politicized our notion of food production, food consumption, food distribution, and they've politicized the relations between people. Uh, and I think that, that that's, and of course, what kind of systems we put in place to, um, to manage the, the relationships uh, among people in different sectors. Thank you. Um, David or Lois, any further thoughts? Um, I, I think we're so integrated into this planet uh, because of our selfishness that it's not going to be an it's not, it's not going to be an easy journey to step out. I think, without doubt, I'm probably speaking to some of the most powerful people on the planet, right here in this room, uh, compared to huge numbers of other people throughout the planets and other or planet and and, and other uh, continents. Uh, U.S. and Canadian people are very but the per, our per capita use of the world's energy and 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 the, and the world's food supplies and access to the world's knowledge. It's in your lap, and you better well study and, and get as much as you can and get a get a degree and get out of the university to get into the real world. But I think the the challenge we've got is to reconcile that we're certainly part of the issue. Is we have a political system that's probably we, we all hate it, but it's better than anything else in the planet. I mean, uh, Churchill said that, wasn't it? You know, this is the worst form of democracy, with the exception of all the rest. So, as imperfect as it is, I think we have to take it the way it is and move forward. Will we become food sovereigntists in the in our lifetime? Maybe not, but there may be a portion of our society that will be. We're talking land and water and energy and fuel and seed. That's the heart of food sovereignty. So where does that product come from? Who owns it now? Who's gonna give it up easily? Who, how are we gonna access it? How do we sustain it? How does that sustain us when it gets cold? What do we do with all these questions we're not gonna answer easily and that requires good politics, it requires some capital, it requires some knowledge transfers and, and et cetera. It, re it requires a spirit of wanting to continue on when the business side of it says to stop, you're right about, about a friend of mine, the only way he could retire was to sell his farm. That's how he could retire, otherwise he would live in poverty. So that's the level of capitalism and, and the dollars attached. So all these pieces are all together, woven together. It's not a simple journey. Whether you run for politics or you become a faith leader or you become a teacher or you become a wise, a gifted uh, um, a leader in the, in, the, in the business community, we're all integrated together. We're, we're in this together. So if some of us win, I think we all win. But I think the challenge is those that step out first, the vanguard ones, are going to pay the biggest price. Because you get hit a lot when you're in the leadership role of things. So be prepared for that in a country that's subtle because we're polite, nice Canadians, but we can sure make it bad and hard for you if we don't like you. All right, well, I think we're, we're coming to a close here, so I would like to uh, just ask you once again to, to help me and, and thank Eric and, and the panelists for their wonderful presentation. And uh, I wanted to mention that uh, our next speaker, actually, he's, he's at the top of the, the lecture hall there, Dr. Kirit Patel. Um, 
Yeah, please, stand up, Kurt. He, he's just returned from Sri Lanka, where he was uh, visiting some of the, the projects that he's working on. And um, he's going to be speaking March 20th. Um, Dr. Patel will, will be speaking on the topic of post-green revolution agrarian change and the burden of malnutrition in South Asia. And uh, Dr. Patel is involved in a very huge uh, IDRC-funded project in India, uh, um, Nepal, and uh, Sri Lanka. And he's working very closely with farmers, with consumers, uh, on the issue of revitalizing the use of millets. And it's an incredibly important area of study, and, and I think quite a different kind of presentation uh, in March. So I want to encourage you to come out. And uh, then the last thing is please join us uh, up in uh, the reception area for some light refreshments. Um, and so, yeah, thanks again for coming.